The international scientific community is abuzz as the world was introduced to never before seen images of the far reaches of space from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, JWST is a project 25 years in the making with a budget of over $10 billion, named after James E. Webb, an administrator of NASA in the 1960s who led the Apollo program. This new telescope is expected to be the catalyst for many new discoveries and developments in the coming decades. Today, we have the honor of speaking with a critical contributor to the Webb Telescope, Dr. Marsha Riki from the University of Arizona. Dr. Riki is the lead investigator for the Near Infrared Camera, or NIRCAM, on the telescope. And for you astronomy fans, Dr. Riki and her husband are absolute legends in the field of infrared astronomy. Dr. Riki, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us this morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me on. Well, Dr. Riki, this is uh, very exciting. The first set of images that came in uh, from the telescope. But before we get into the details of that, um, can you start us off by explaining the big difference and why this new telescope is a technological marvel and what is allowing us to see. Okay, this telescope is a technological marvel because it is so large um, that it had to be folded up to fit into the rocket. And that engendered a number of issues that had to be solved. I mean, how do you make a mirror, which is usually made of glass, fold up? Well, we made it out of 18 segments of beryllium so that it could be folded. And some of the other technologies that had to be developed were related to the fact that this is an infrared telescope, meaning it has to be kept very cold. So it needs a sun shield to keep the heat from the sun, the earth, and the moon off the telescope and the instruments. Mm. And uh, contrasting it with the another famous uh, telescope, the Hubble telescope, which you also worked on as well and you're very familiar with, the Hubble telescope actually is in orbit around the Earth, but the Webb telescope is not in orbit. You guys shot it off into uh, some region in space, right? Yes, it's a, a space um, area called the second Lagrange point. And the reason for doing that is related to wanting to keep heat off and also wanting to be in a spot where the telescope would be in the same relative position to the Earth as both go around the sun. That makes it easier to send the information back. But being at this point in space, about four times further away from the Earth than the moon is, meant that all of the heat sources like the moon, the Earth, and the sun are all in the same direction. So the sun shield can block all of them at once. Oh, that is absolutely brilliant. Um, let's jump into the topic of infrared uh, telescope. And so infrared, uh, to those living a common life here on Earth, is I, I know it as heat, right? So you kind of, you know, um, if you turn on your electrical stove at home, the, the heat that you feel on your hand, that's infrared. But how does that translate into a telescope? It actually works the same way as visible light in, in the telescope sense. So if you have metal reflecting the light, which is the case with Webb because all the mirrors are gold coated, then whether it's visible light or infrared light or even somewhat longer wavelength light, they all reflect off the mirrors. And so you can use the telescope to gather the light and focus it to a point. And your um, part of the contribution to the telescope was the near-infrared camera, meaning, I'm guessing, the short wave, the shortest of the infrareds? That's right. Um, Near-cam's longest wavelength um, is about 10 times visible light. Its shortest wavelength actually is 
very deep red and you're at a wavelength your eye could just barely see. Mm. And let's now jump into um, the role that your husband actually also played. He's on the opposite ends of this uh, end of the spectrum, isn't he? Yes, his, his instrument specializes in detecting the longest um, wavelengths that are available on web. So his instrument's called MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. And its shortest wavelength is the longest wavelength that NIRCAM can do. And its longest wavelength is, gee, about 50 times the wavelength of visible light. So it goes out pretty far. Wow. Okay, so... I've been looking at the photos that were released that got sent back from the telescope. And to be honest, when I first saw them, I thought they were paintings. I didn't think they were <laughs> telescope images because it just the vibrancy, the color that you saw and just it, it, it was spectacular. And I could not believe that it was not a painting. But what are what are these first images that are being sent back? What is it telling us about our universe and our neighboring galaxies and, and space in general? Uh, it's telling us a variety of things. First, it's telling us that it's a good thing we can finally study the universe at these infrared wavelengths with this kind of detail. We've been able to detect these wavelengths for a while, but never never this finely. And so we're seeing things literally in a different kind of light. The image that is touted as um, the one that's seen furthest back or deepest into the universe, what's truly special about that image is that it represents uh, exposure time of, oh, about half a day total for all of the different colors of light, all the different filters that were used. The same kind of image to sort of the same approximate depth from Hubble took 14 days. Wow. And so, yeah, so when we're going to come back in September and we're going to expose 10 times longer and we hope to get right to the beginning of when stars and galaxies began to form. So that's going to be a key thing. Some of the other things that came out of this first batch of data is that you can see dust in the universe much more clearly now, particularly with MIRI. And then there was the study of the exoplanet atmosphere where you can see water vapor in that exoplanet's atmosphere, which was quite difficult for Hubble to do. So you could see atmospheric composition with this telescope? And and that, does that mean we could discover possibly habitable planets? It does mean that we could discover habitable planets. And there are a lot of people taking um, spectra of these exoplanet atmospheres with the hope that they will find one that matches Earth. Wow. Um, and you briefly talked about how this telescope could tell us when stars or look as far back as when stars started to form. But in a timeline, uh, what is that? What, uh, how many millions of years are we talking about? Or how many billions of years are we talking about here? I have no idea how to put this into perspective. Okay, well, we, we, we know that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. And we know that we can't see all the way back to the Big Bang. We can only see back to about 500,000 years because of how the gas was behaving before that. And somewhere between 500,000 years and about 400 million years after the Big Bang, somewhere in that range is where these first stars and galaxies formed. But Hubble, because it doesn't have infrared capability, can't go any further back than about 400 million years. We hope to get to within 50 million years of the Big Bang, which if Mother Nature cooperated, we'll be able to see these first galaxies. Wow. Uh, I still can't quite wrap around the timeline, but it almost sounds like time travel. So the images that we'll be seeing are basically actions that occurred hundreds or billions of years ago, basically is what you're <laughs> saying. 
That's exactly what I'm saying. And the reason it works this way is that light doesn't go infinitely fast. Light travels through space at 300,000 kilometers per second. So it can take a very long time for light to get to us from these distant objects. So we see them as they were a long time ago. In other words, when they were young. Mm. Um, now, so like you said, you folded up this giant telescope to make it fit into a rocket, shot it up into space, but not in orbit, past our orbit. You made it kind of float somewhere in the middle of space somewhere by unfolding these thermal shield sails there is a bazillion things that could go wrong how did you guys pull it off um we pulled it off because all of the there's something like what 344 um possible failures that could have ruined the mission but we practiced and we practiced and we practiced some more to make certain that we had everything just right and uh, I, uh, some of the articles said it's uh, 25 years in the making. It's also, it was a consortium, right? You guys had contributions from many different uh, agencies that contributed to this telescope. Indeed. The three lead agencies, of course, are NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. But all told, um, people from 14 different countries worked on building this project so it's pretty pretty amazing um there was a little bit of a mishap i heard when i mean this was something that was com completely out of the control of the operators a tiny little micro meteoroid actually hit the telescope one of the mirrors what was the damage uh, from that and how is that going to affect the performance of the telescope yeah, it made a little tiny little dent in one of the 18 segments. And before that, the telescope was um, working, um, let's put it this way. The requirement for the telescope was that it, it have a, a wavefront error. And this is a measure of how well it focuses the light. So it was supposed to have a wavefront error of 135 nanometers. Before that, micrometeoroid hit, the telescope was performing beyond expectations at 50 nanometers. And the micrometeoroid meteoroid degraded it to 60 nanometers. So 60 is still much better than the originally planned 135. Mm -hmm. So it's annoying, but the telescope is still working great. And is, is that going to affect the lifespan of the telescope? And what is the lifespan that you guys are expecting? Well, the original plan was um, five to 10 years, and it now looks like it could go for more than 20 because there's enough um, fuel to do the, what we call station keeping, keeping it at the special point in space. And there, there was a budget for having micrometeoroid hits, but the thing was this particular one was bigger than, than most that had been expected. And we don't yet know if it was just a piece of bad luck or if we're going to get more of those, but we still have a fair bit of room before the mirror gets really bad. Mm -hmm. And um, another question that I had is, for decades, you are one of a handful of people that basically got the best view of space. Um, and you had the highest resolution of being able to look out into space. And when you see thousands of stars, when you, or thousands, millions, billions of stars, and then seeing this new image coming in from the telescope what were the emotions what was the feeling that you got as a scientist who's been looking and stargazing your entire life i i was just uh, you know beyond cloud nine so to speak because i knew intellectually that this telescope should be able to make absolutely gorgeous finely detailed images but until you actually see them and see them as rendered in the in the color the way that the media experts at Space Telescope Science Institute did, it just it just astounded me. Wow. Um, 
And, you know, South Korea recently was able to launch uh, a satellite and our space program is, um, you know, advancing and we're making a lot of strides for aspiring astronomers and um, space scientists. Do you have uh, any words of encouragement? I do. One, the main word of encouragement is to be sure you have a lot of perseverance because sometimes things don't go right. Rockets blow up, all sorts of bad things can happen. But hang in there and eventually you'll get a gorgeous result. Well, uh, Dr. Riki, thank you so much for your time once again. It was an honor and a privilege to have uh, spoken to such a important person, such a great contributor to uh, the field of science and astronomy. And um, we hope to uh, see many, many, many more brilliant pictures and discoveries from your work and from the telescope. I'm sure some more will be coming soon. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.